Hi guys. I hope you're having a great day. And I wanted to create a video because I just watched my friend Mia Davies do a, a video, um, a Facebook Live. And and I love Mia. I think I love her heart. I love her the, her mind, I love the way she thinks, and I love the fact that she's courageous enough to stand up and start speaking. Um, not start, she's been speaking her mind for some time, you know, since the, the corona thing happened. And I'd also like to shout out friends like Dallas Michael Sear out of Austin, Texas. He also is speaking his mind. Amir Rosich, um, same, same. And guys like Brian Rose, I don't know Brian, um, but, you know, uh, London Real some of that stuff. I think it's really necessary that stuff's going out, but I have really held off on uh, voicing an opinion because, you know, my opinion is just like everything, like what you've heard, right? We've all got one. And uh, I don't want to invest my energy into the arguments that are taking place on social media. Um, but I have had like a call, like in my, in, in my bones, like, or a question. It's like, what should I be doing right now? Should I be talking about this or should I just go about my business? And the answer that I've received is um, go about your business, man. Take care of yourself. Um, be well, raise frequency. And, uh, and when people are ready to uh, make a change or, or open up uh, to some new possibilities, then yeah, man, I'm here for them. But I, I really don't want to uh, participate in what's going on in social media. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that it was, it's by design and watching what I heard, from a mentor back in the 90s that this uh, whole system is set up to create dissension, Democrat, Republican. You know, if you have a Democrat and Republican, they have two separate ideologies, right? What's gonna happen? They're gonna fight and they're gonna argue. Now, if you're a Democrat and I'm a Republican, guess what's gonna happen over Thanksgiving dinner? We're gonna argue, we're gonna fight. And unbelievable how some people, like families just break apart and they don't talk because of their political views, right? <clears throat> My friend, mentor in the 90s, what, he woke me up to that. He says, you really don't know how things have to work on the planet, do you? And uh, I didn't have a clue because I took history for in, in public school. So I was basically lied to. And he said, listen, man, like the United States gained its independence um, in what, 1776. He says, and they got us back when they put the central banking system back into the United States because they owned the currency, right? And uh, if you haven't watched the movie Zeitgeist, I highly recommend you do that. Suspend any disbelief and uh, leave your your um, ideology at the door. But be, have an open mind and watch that movie. It'll it'll be a, a great wake up for you. Um, and anyway, he just he let me know that the 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 people that we know who are the very wealthy, like that's the wealthiest guy on the planet. Bill Gates is the richest guy on the planet. You know, is horseshit. Um, that's just who we know. The people who have unlimited resources, who pull the strings and are running the major agenda, they have access to unlimited resources. Like, it's not like in the billions. If they have, they can print their money. They can just type it into um, any account they want. They got digital currency, they do whatever the heck they want. And so we don't know about those guys. Those guys are at the very top. And then when you come down, you got the big banking system, right? World banks, then you've got um, like the, the the regular banks, and then you've got, Guess what's below that? Politics. You've got the presidency, man, right? And then uh, below that, you've got um, us, right? So we think that like the president's up here and at the top of this thing pulling the strings. And that's not the case, man. He's like in the middle. Like there's a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of deviance above that pulling the strings that don't give a shit about you and I. You know, that's, I love what George Carlin said in that epic little clip, like who runs America. Um, they do not care about you and I, right? They just don't. And I think that's hard for people to get in their minds because, you know, we're, we're like evolved. Like we, we trust our parents, right? Our parents got have our back. They have our best interest in mind, right? And we think that's the way it's going to be with the, the entire hierarchy in the system, but it's not the way it works. It's not the way it is, man. And so he let me know that the economy, will tank he said you know the last thing that that these people want is all these independent tribes and nations and peoples with their critical free thinking um selves they've got to get people all on the same page so they can be controlled right and how do you control uh, people you starve them out <laughs> you starve them out you break them you break them and you starve them and then you come in with the solution and you say here we go 
and, you know, and that new solution is going to be that one world government is going to be a global currency. Um, if you don't, uh, you know, your, your currency will be all digital, right? Whether it's in you or on a card, um, you go to the store and your card doesn't work. What can you do now? You, I, just, I heard this on a YouTube video. And it's like, yeah, this is right. You pull out some cash and you buy your stuff, right? In a cashless society, if your card doesn't work, guess what happens? You don't buy your stuff. You don't buy your food. So <clears throat> if you are a dissenter, if you're going against the grain of the agenda, what do they do? Turn off your card and you can't buy food, right? There, like things that are happening right now um, that are pretty, I'll just call it fascinating, is that the if you're not vaccinated, this is kind of part of the agenda as well. If you're not vaccinated, then you don't get to travel. You don't get to go into public you know, uh, buildings. You don't get to <coughs> vote. Like those are the types of things that will, s things like that or those things exactly will roll out. And that's what um, will usher in this new, new, I guess, society. Um, but uh, Todd, it was his name, Todd told me this in the 90s. He said, once the United States falls, then the rest of the world will fall uh, as well. And when you take a country of mavericks and, you know, we are a bunch of free thinkers here. Now, there's a lot of bottom line, just dumb shits, man. People who are drinking from the very top of the, of the pond with the, the scum and the dead bugs. There are people who are drinking deep from the wellspring, man right? They're critically thinking, they're taking their time, they're staying, you know, out of the, the bullshit and they're thinking for themselves. And they're so, you know, working with smart people who <laughs> they think. But then a lot of Americans, if the electricity goes out and they can't heat a hot pocket, they're going to come unglued. So can you imagine what will happen when a currency fails or, you know, some, like, can you imagine what would happen if our power grid went out? Oh, it would be pandemonium here. But it's those types of scenarios um, can play out, like food supplies, food shortages um, that are literally created. Um, they got you by the short hairs, man. <laughs> they got you by the short hairs. And what are you going to do when you can't feed your family? You know, and somebody comes in and says, hey, I'll feed your family, but this is what it's going to look like. You're going to feed your family, right? And that's how this stuff comes down. So when the United States fail, falls, every other country will fall under, underneath that one umbrella. And <clears throat> it's a whole brand new world. These, uh, the things that are coming out with like AI, um, artificial intelligence. I love Elon Musk, man. I think he's a rock star, brilliant. And I saw his interview on Joe Rogan about um, neural implants. And I, I, sh I shuddered. <laughs> you know, an implant in your brain that literally will connect to every neural pathway in your mind. It also connects to the cloud, right? To the internet. So let's say I have neural implants in my brain and I'm accessing Google and all this information. Who's going to kick ass in a boardroom meeting, <laughs> right? Who's going to kick some ass like in, uh, you know, board games that <laughs> I'm going to? And what are you going to want to do? You're going to want to keep up. So you're going to want to get a neural implant as well and connect to the internet. And you might be like scoffing, but go check it out. There, it's, it's happening. They're putting neural implants in uh, people like uh, paraplegics, quadriplegics, people with Parkinson's, and they're getting results. They're able to actually help these people with Parkinson's. They're, they're working on making uh, people who are paralyzed mobile through these neural implants. And that's how it works, right? They, they test it the ground there, but pretty soon some guy's going to have a neural implant in his brain that's like connected to the entire uh, neural web of his mind and he's going to be one sharp dude or or woman and everyone's going to want to follow along people say no way i would never do that who do you know that doesn't own a phone and i'm not talking a home phone i'm talking like a cell phone how many people do you know who still own flip phones i know three um, that's how it happens, right? It's just like the latest, greatest technologies. Everybody wants to keep up and you'll be asking for it. God, please give me a, give me a, an implant <laughs> so I can keep up. Um, hopefully not you, but people will. And that's some incredibly, I think, strange things that are absolutely on the horizon. Elon Musk said that that would happen probably within the next 10 years, 20 years max. And uh, that's freaky to me. And then you, I've heard, you know, the different stories about the vaccines and different things like that. And um, nobody's going to poke me with a 
with vaccine. Man. Like, it's just not going to happen. I'll be the guy that gets locked out of, you know, the grocery store. They'll turn off my card. I'm not doing it. Um, but the other thing I'm not doing is I'm not going to fight everybody. What I wanted to get to with this was back in 2007, I had just rebuilt my life, my financial life, also my personal life. And was uh, going great guns. I leveraged the uh, equity in my home and bought more equipment for my construction company. And late in 2007, the summer of 2007, my phone went from ringing off the hook to where like, hey man, I'll you know I'll have to get with you, get back with you. We're booked, we're busy. So the next day, my phone stopped ringing. It was like, what the heck? Did somebody like blow up the T-Mobile towers? <clears throat> and that's when the economy started to, to unravel. Um, happened for me in, clear back in 2007. All of my contractors would just went dark overnight. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, and I was terrified. I was scared. I was scared. I was hiding my work trucks from the repo man, trying to figure out, like shuffling the jets, so to speak, to figure out what the next uh, move was. And I remember uh, my wife was like, "Dude, just go get a job." Like what behind the 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 ten thousand other people in line for that one job? Um, same thing's happening, by the way. So it was uh, scary to watch that thing and be a part of that economic downturn. But what it did is it gave me some time, and I opened up my laptop and I started watching. Uh, that's when Loose Change came out, that documentary about nine um, eleven, and I watched Freedom to Fascism with Aaron Russo, the guy who produced the movie Trading Places, um, launched Bette Midler's career, ran for governor of Nevada, met with Nick Rockefeller. Uh, Nick Rockefeller turned him in or onto the agenda that was playing out. The agenda that was playing out, according to Nick Rockefeller, is basically exactly what I just explained to you, you know, a few minutes ago. And Aaron Russo was like, I'm not that guy. I don't wanna see, you know, that this happened to humanity. Um, so I watched that with Aaron Russo. Uh, what else did I watch? Zeitgeist. And I remember getting, I went to a really, really dark place. It's like, is this the future of humanity? Is this the, 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 the future for my children? And it got so dark. Um, you know, I, I started praying a lot, put it that way. But I, something that happens, I picked up two books. I picked up, um, Night by Ellie Wiesel. And I reread the book, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, because what I was seeing was that that was a strong possibility future for all of us, you know. And, uh, and so I read those books and in the midst of it, I was really freaked out. And my wife one night, man, in, the, in bed, she took my laptop and slammed it shut. And she says, shut, you know, stop doing that because I was, I was getting weird because things are kind of weird compared to what we were taught, right? And I had a um, I had a God moment. I had a download, and like literally, God tapped me on my shoulder deep, 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 and kind of chuckled and said, "Oh, oh boy, uh, it's not about you know guns. It's not about what the weapons. It's not about money. It's not about all that." He says, "That's they got all that stuff." He said, "For you, like this is a spiritual thing, man. This is just about going in." And I was shown like. This might be woo-woo for you, but hell, everything's kind of weird and woo-woo right now, right? But I was given a vision that like, you know, when we raise our frequency, actually, it wasn't just a vision and a download, it's in this book. When enough people raise their frequency to a high, like a high level, then we literally affect and change other people on the planet. And I got this vision that like when the frequency is raised high enough that people will just put down their guns. You know, that um, people's minds will change, things will go in a good direction. Now, I don't know if that's going to unfold that way, but that's what I, rest, um, I rested on and I hung my hat on and I still do to this day. You know, that's why I'm not trying to change you. That's not why I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm not arguing on social media. Um, I, I do my best to invest that time into raising my own personal frequency, pray, um, think, and meditate, and listen for the answers. And so... Um, that's the first time I really got clear that that agenda that my mentor in the 90s talked about was was happening, right? It was happening. And um, we've had, what, 10 years, 11 years since all that happened? And now this is the big one. This is the big one. And I think it's coming down. Um, but I want to read you something in uh, from Knight. It's kind of a 
I think it's very appropriate for now. And it's what's happening on social media. It's what's happening to us, you and me, everyone in our country and, and, and elsewhere is happening. So I'm going to read to you right now. Sit back. This is from Night by Ellie Wiesel. It says, one day I asked my father to find me a master who could guide me. And this is true, by the way. This is a true story. To guide me in the studies of, of the Kabbalah. You're too young for that. I don't know how to say this name, but I'm going to give it a shot. Maimon, Maimonides tells us that one must be 30 before venturing into the world of mysticism, a world fraught with peril. First, you must study the basic subjects, those you are able to comprehend. My father was a cultured man, rather unsentimental. He rarely displayed his feelings, not even within his family, and was more involved with the welfare of others than with that of his own kin. Reminds me of me, and I've paid the price for that. I regret it. The Jewish community of Siget held him in highest esteem. His advice on public and even private matters was frequently sought. There were four of us children, Hilda the eldest, then Bay, I was thir the third and the only son. Zipporah was the youngest. My parents ran a store. Hilda and Bay helped with the work. As for me, my place was in the house of study, or so they said. There are no Kabbalists in Saget, my father would often tell me. He wanted to drive the idea of studying the Kabbalah from my mind. In vain, I uh, succeeded on my own in finding a master for myself in the person of Moishi the Beetle. He had watched me. He had watched me one day as I prayed at dusk. Why do you cry when you pray? He asked, as though he knew me well. I don't know, I answered, troubled. I never asked myself that question. I cried because something inside me felt the need to cry. That was all I knew. Why do you pray? He asked after a moment. Why did I pray? Strange question. Why did I live? Why did I breathe? I don't know, I told him. Even more troubled and ill at ease. I don't know. From that day on, I saw him often. He explained to me with great emphasis that every question possessed a power that was lost in the answer. Man comes closer to God through the questions he asks him, he liked to say. Therein lies true dialogue. Man asks, man asks and God replies, but we don't understand his replies. We cannot, we cannot understand them because they dwell in the depths of our souls and remain there until we die. The real answers, Eliezer, you will find only within yourself. And why do you pray, Moishi? I asked him. I pray to the God within me for the strength to ask him the real questions. We spoke that way almost every evening, remaining in the synagogue long after all the faithful had gone, sitting in the semi-darkness where only a few half burnt candles provided a flicker, flickering light. One evening I told him how unhappy I was not to be able to find in Saget a master to teach me the Zohar, the Kabbalistic works, the secrets of Jewish mysticism. Kid sound reminds me of me. <laughs> and uh, he smiled indulgently. After a long silence, he said, there are a thousand and one gates allowing entry into the orchard of mystical truth. Every human being has his own gate. He must not err and wish to enter the orchard through a gate other than his own. That would present a danger not only for the one entering, but also for those who are already inside. And Moishi the Beetle, the poorest of the poor of Siget, spoke to me for hours on end about the Kabbalah's revelations and, and its mysteries. Thus began my initiation. Together we would read over and over the same page of the Zohar, not to learn it by heart, but to discover within the very essence of divinity. And in the course of those evenings, I became convinced that Moishi the Beetle would help me enter eternity into that time when my quest, into that time when question and answer would become one. And then one day, all foreign Jews were expelled from Siget, and Moishi the Beetle was a foreigner. Crammed into cattle cars by the Hungarian police, they cried silently. Standing on the station platform, we too were crying. The train disappeared over the horizon. All that was left was thick, dirty smoke. Behind me, someone said, sighing, what do you expect? That's war. The deportees were quickly forgotten. A few days after they left, it was rumored that they were in Galicia working and even that they were content with their fate. Days went by, then weeks and months. Life was normal again. A calm, reassuring wind blew through our homes. The shopkeepers were doing good business. The students lived among their books and the children played in the streets. One day, as I was about to enter the synagogue, I saw Moishi the Beetle sitting on a bench near the entrance. He told me what had happened to him and his companions. 
The train with the deportees had crossed into the Hungarian border, crossed the Hungarian border, once in Polish territory, had been taken over by the Gestapo. The train had stopped. The Jews were ordered to get off and onto waiting trucks. The trucks headed toward the forest. There, everybody was ordered to get out. They were forced to dig huge trenches. When they had finished their work, the men from the Gestapo began theirs. Without passion or haste, they shot their prisoners, who were forced to approach the trench one by one and offer their necks. Infants were tossed into the air and used as targets for the machine guns. This took place in the Galician forest near Kolome. How had he, Moishi the Beetle, been able to escape? By a miracle. He was wounded in the leg and left for dead. Day after day, night after night, he went from one Jewish house to the next, telling his story and that of Malka, the young girl who lay dying for three days, and that of Toby, the tailor who begged to die before his sons were killed. Moishi was not the same. The joy in his eyes was gone, obviously. He no longer sang. He no longer mentioned either God or Kabbalah. He spoke only of what he had seen. But people not only refused to believe his tales, they refused to listen. Some even insinuated that he only wanted their pity, that he was imagining things. Others flatly said that he had gone mad. Convenient. As for Moishi, he wept and pleaded, Jews, listen to me. That's all I ask of you. No money, no pity, just listen to me. He kept shouting in synagogue between the prayer at dusk and the evening prayer. Even I did not believe him. I often sat with him after services and listened to his tales, trying to understand his grief, but all I felt was pity. They think I'm mad, he whispered, and tears like drops of wax flowed from his eyes. Once I asked him the question, why do you want people to believe you so much? In your place, I would not care whether they believe me or not. He closed his eyes as if to escape time. You don't understand, he said in despair. You cannot, you cannot understand. I was saved miraculously. I succeeded in coming back. Where did I get my strength? I want to return to Saget to describe you my death so that you might ready yourselves while there's still time. Life, I no longer care to live. I am alone, but I wanted to come back to warn you. Only no one is listening to me. This was toward the end of 1942. Thereafter, life seemed normal. Once again, London Radio, which we listened to every evening, announced encouraging news. The daily bombings of Germany and Stalingrad the preparation of the Second Front, and so we, the Jews of Saget, waited for better days that surely were soon to come. I continued to devote myself to my studies, Talmud during the day, and Kabbalah at night. My father took care of his business in the community. My grandfather came to spend Ra Rosh Hashanah with us, so to attend the services of the celebrated Rebbe of Borshe. I'm not Jewish, and so these words are foreign to me. My mother was beginning to think it was high time to find an appropriate match for Hilda, Thus passed the year 1943. Spring 1944, splendid news from the Russian front. There could no longer be any doubt. Germany would be defeated. It was only a matter of time, months or weeks perhaps. The trees were in bloom. It was a year like so many others. With its spring, its engagements, its weddings and its births, the people were saying the Red Army is advancing with giant strides. Hitler will not be able to harm us even if he wants to. Yes, we even doubted his resolve to exterminate us, annihilate an entire people, wipe out a population dispersed throughout so many nations, so many millions of people, by what means? In the middle of the 20th century. And thus my elders concerned themselves with all manners of things, strategy, diplomacy, politics, and Zionism, but not with their own fate. Even Moishi the Beetle had fallen silent. He was weary of talking. He would, not, he would drift through synagogue or through the streets, hunched over, eyes cast down, avoiding people's gaze. In those days, it was still possible to buy emigration certificates to Palestine. I had asked my father to sell everything, to liquidate everything, and to leave. I'm too old, my son answered. Too old to start a new life. I'm going to forward here just a, a wee bit. The eighth day, eighth days, the eight days of Passover. The weather was sublime. My mother was busy in the kitchen. The synagogues were no longer open. People gathered in private homes. No need to provoke the Germans. Almost every rabbi's home became a house of prayer. We drank, we ate, we sang. The Bible commands us to rejoice during the eight days of celebration, but our hearts were not in it. We wished the holiday would end so as not to have to pretend. On the seventh day of Passover, the curtain finally rose. The Germans arrested the leaders of the Jewish community. 
from that moment on, everything happened very quickly. The race toward death had begun. First edict, Jews were prohibited from leaving their residences for three days under penalty of death. Moishi the beetle came running to our house. I warned you, he shouted and left without waiting for a response. The same day, the Hungarian police burst into every Jewish home in town. A Jew was henceforth forbidden to own gold, jewelry, or any valuables. Everything had to be handed over to the authorities under penalty of death. My father went down to the cellar and buried our savings. As for my mother, she went on tending to the many chores in the house. Sometimes she would stop and gaze at us in silence. Three days later, a new decree. Every Jew had to wear the yellow star. Some prominent members of the community came to consult with my father who had connections at the upper levels of the Hungarian police. They wanted to know what we, he thought of the situation. My father's view was that it was not all bleak or perhaps he just did not want to discourage the others to throw salt on their wounds. The yellow star, so what? It's not lethal. Poor father, of what then did he die? But the edicts were already being issued. We no longer had the right to frequent restaurants or cafes, to travel by rail, to attend synagogue, to be on the streets after six o'clock in the evening. Then came the ghettos. So it goes on and on. Anyway, that was uh, that. I still think about that section where Moishi the Beetle was uh, at the border and in that forest and digging trenches. And I can just visualize, I can just see these poor, manipulated, brainwashed Gestapo, undoubtedly had families, throwing babies in the air and shooting them as target practice. Like, how desensitized can people get, right? But the same type of propaganda, the same type of manipulation, the same type of psychological warfare is happening right now. And, and so many people on social media are just being spoon fed this stuff. And you know, it's one of those things that you know, some people, uh, to me, it's like this, like if you walk in, like when you were a kid, I don't know if you did it, I did it, it was shocking. Um, when I walked in on my parents, I was like, well, damn, that's not a stork. <laughs> you know, it was shocking. Kind of like the Wizard of Oz, when they get to Oz and they pull back the curtain, it's a little short dude pulling all the handles it's like that but much more um malevolent much more um evil i think um and it's, it's playing out it's playing out so for myself why am i not getting all up in arms about this because i did back in 2007 8 9 and i was the moishi the beetle people just got sick and freaking tired of hearing me talk about it. And so I stopped talking about it, but I didn't stop talking about it because I wasn't doing something about it. I stopped talking about it and I started doing more about it and um, more of the work that I know is actually going to be beneficial, which is um, attaching myself to very well-intentioned, well-intelligent people to the best of my ability and then to do the work on myself you know, to raise my frequency, to, to go in and hear that still small voice, to get my answers from within, you know, just like it talks about in this book. And that's not where I got it. It's just like, that's, that's the way it works, you know? And, uh, and that's what I've been doing. And so when COVID came around, I could feel that wash of depression hit me. Um, because I, for myself, like, I know it's like, it's unfolding, like right now it's unfolding. So it wasn't super shocking or surprising. Well, kind of, because anytime it starts, <laughs> it's pretty shocking. Our entire way of life changed, you know, overnight. And, and it's not going back the way it was. And so um, in this, the past few months, the past, what, two and a half, three months, um, it's just been a process of taking care of myself and taking care of mine, you know, my people. And um, I'm, I'm vigilant about that. And so as this uh, continues to unfold, I hope people just pray, meditate, go in, stop fighting, unplug, uh, give everybody a break. <laughs>